All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Oad. Um, I uh, work at Red Hat, where I mostly uh, work on Foreman. Um, before working at Red Hat, I worked at a company, a German company called Infineon, maybe some of you knows it, uh, where I was trying um, to solve real problems for as a sysadmin, um, where initially the background was having lots and lots of data centers, lots and lots of resources, and trying to figure out how to uh, simplify using them, uh, both for the guy responsible maintaining them and also for the ones consuming them. Uh, so just out of curiosity, how many guys know Foreman here? Use it? Awesome. Uh, for those who don't know you, how many of you use Puppet? Or All right, great. And the rest is, is great. So I, I hope that in this talk, for those of you who use it already, you'll learn something new. For those of you who don't use it, maybe I'll convince you to start looking into it. Um, in either case, feel free to ask any question whatsoever at any point in time. I like being questioned a lot. So let's start. What's Foreman? So overall, Foreman tries to uh, manage systems lifecycle, um, caring for all of this uh, initial setup that is required, whether it's the actual machine that needs or VM that needs to be uh, running, uh, or maybe even stuff before that, like uh, DNS, uh, IP addresses, and, and things like that. Uh, then, obviously, get the system running and then take care for its long, you know, kind of uh, workflow, or what happens after the system is running. Could be a year, could be a month, whatever, all life cycle. Um, so, we're talking about provisioning, configuration, and monitoring of that setup. So provisioning, basically, um, we do, can do either bare metal virtualization or cloud. We try to um, be agnostic to the platform you end up using, uh, or uh, whether it's a bare metal or not. We think that the process is, should be, from an operator point of view, should be more or less the same thing. Whether you create it on a VM or create it on a bare metal, overall, the, the experience, the user experience, should be as, simple, as similar as possible. Um, when we talk about configuration, uh, Foreman has a very tight integration with Puppet. Um, there's a, something called an ENC, external node classifier, which basically means uh, Puppet asks Foreman, hey, I got this system, can you tell me what, what is it about? What should it be doing? Um, tell me. I'll, I'll implement, just tell me. So we basically classify and, and say, and alternati additionally, we also have, for those of you who know Puppet, uh, support for parameterized classes and a hierarchical uh, backend storage. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and where, when we talk about monitoring, it's not your average Nagios monitoring, but rather um, showing you the state of your system, whether it actually ran Puppet, Puppet did it do any changes, was there, were there any failures, um, so basically giving you a state of your configuration management. So monitor what's going on. Additionally, you get things like inventory and trends over time. So let's go and try to go backward a little bit and explain high, on the high level architecture. Um, so we have Foreman in the middle. Uh, we have um, either web users or API users uh, logging into Foreman. Then when Foreman needs to uh, for example, create a virtual machine or uh, bare metal, it has a, an extension called uh, the proxies, Foreman Smart Proxies. The idea behind the proxies is they actually do uh, the changes that are required. So Foreman orchestrate across its proxies uh, and ask, for example, there's a proxy to implement uh, DNS. So maybe you have a Microsoft DNS server, or maybe you have Bind. So each one of them could be a different proxy, and the foreman basically will just say, OK, create me a DNS tree for this system. And the same goes for various uh, services. Could be DHCP, could be uh, um, Puppet Certificate Authority, could be um, uh, the BMC for power management, and so on. Um, ideally, or the idea behind it that the proxies are basically federated out, where you have maybe multiple data centers, and you have a centralized foreman, and uh, have uh, many proxies running on different data centers, or maybe segmented networks or, or something like that. So this gives you, from uh, a single place, you could actually view your entire infrastructure and orchestrate across your entire infrastructure, cross ones, cross whatever, um, DMZs and so on. Um, 
The other integration, of course, is with Puppet, where we have known interfaces uh, with known interfaces with Puppet, so we know how to uh, get the inventory from Factor. We know how to uh, parse reports about what Puppet did, and we can tell Puppet what to do in terms of uh, an ENC. Now, a side note is that many people choose to use Foreman only for some parts. So really, you don't need to use Foreman for provisioning. You can just use it for reporting. Like completely read-only, separated from your infrastructure, just give you at a glance uh, you know, your state of, of Puppet. You don't have to do the whole thing. Some people... So basically, the idea from, design, from the design is that you can mix and match uh, the features that you care about, and the rest, you know, either implement them at a later time or, or don't implement them at all. Um, <laughs> And the other part is really talking to various cloud providers. So bare metal, RevM, Overt, which is the same uh, thing we, maybe you saw yesterday, EC2, VMware, vSphere, OpenStack, Rackspace, uh, maybe Open Nebula soon, uh, all this stuff, um, Foreman basically reach out and ask, or behind the scene kind of create the VM for you. You don't need to know the details. There is a kind of simplified API, uh, UI and API, so we can just consume it. Um, besides that, Foreman has a database. It's a Rails application, Ruby on Rails. Um, so the database could be whatever, MySQL, Postgres, etc., SQLite, theoretically Oracle as well. Um, talks to Active Directory or LDAP or has its own internal user management. You can basically mix and match the whole thing. Because we know that different users have different setups, so we try to uh, support all of the various combinations that people might have out there. Right, so in terms of inventory, Foreman by default kind of collects your inventory, um, knows about uh, what is what's is running on its system, depending on your factor uh, inventory. Um, and you could easily do a lot of interesting things. So, for example, generate your own charts uh, based on your own custom facts. Um, you could have all kind of uh, states that happens. Um, you, basically, Foreman reacts to your setup. So whatever you have, uh, in your setup, that's what you'll see in Foreman. It's not that Foreman dictates the data, but you actually see your own, whatever it is, your own systems, your own facts, your own networks, your own customized facts, and so on. Um, same goes for reporting. So kind of a dashboard. We used the word dashboard before. Um, mm -hmm. Dashboard for what's happening in, in your setup, um, telling you in great detail what, what did Puppet do. You could search easily, give me all of the machines that had packet changes or maybe a specific change happened to them, you could easily search through uh, Foreman and um, give you all kind of capabilities like audit log or send emails to the system owner based on errors or whatever it is. Uh, so you'll get something like a simplified uh, view of here's that what Puppet did, uh, this file was changed, you could see a diff of the file that was changed and, and things like that. Um, Obviously, we have the classification uh, of systems, so you could just say this system belongs to this group, for example. That group represents something, your application, your whatever. Uh, and you could then assign uh, classes either to the group or to a specific system. Uh, and you can si assign parameters, you can assign all kinds of things, um, especially around um, uh, parametized classes, pr pretty interesting. Uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll show a real demo, uh, and so on. So this is just, you know, where Foreman imports your classes, and you see your actual Puppet modules and manifest uh, within Foreman. Um, when we come to provisioning, so mentioned that we do private and public clouds. We can do either PXC-based or image-based, depending on the provider. Obviously, PXC doesn't work on a cloud provider, uh, but on a virt virt platform, you can do either PXE or image-based. Uh, we handle DNS, DHCP, TFTP, uh, and so on through the proxies. Um, we have a very um, easy to use uh, templating. Very, if you're using Puppet, you already know the templating language, how to create your own kickstarts and, and snippets. Um, and we basically support all of the major operating system. So from Foreman, you can install as easily uh, an Ubuntu or RHEL or uh, SUSE or Solaris or whatever. Just same process, just you get different operating system at the end. Um, there's also a layer of orchestration when you create, for example, uh, a, a new machine. Um, a lot of things needs to happen 
So let's take a virtual machine create a creation, for example. We can create the storage for the virtual machine, but if there is a failure for some reason, maybe the storage is not available, then we know how to roll back. So we don't leave, like, we don't allocate IP address for you, create a DNS record, and then, oops, storage died. So it's not, storage not available. So we actually have a way to roll back, create the changes, roll back, uh, and things like that. Um, we also know how to handle conflict. So if you have, let's say, a leftover reverse PTR DNS record, we'll say, oh, there is a record here. Maybe it's not supposed to... Uh, you make the decision whether you want to remove that leftover from maybe an older server that used it or something like that. And it's pretty easy also to add your own actions to it. I'll mention the plugin architecture later down the road, but um, we support, basically, we have hooks to everything. So you could, you know, if you have a certain action you want to happen when you create a VM, there's no problem. You just go and update your CMDB or something else that might make sense for you. Uh, in terms of users, we support uh, LDAP Active Directory, authentication, we have a really robust role-based access control. That means you can really uh, define every action in the UI and the API uh, per user or per groups and assign the users groups. Um, so you can really say, okay, this user can only deploy systems here. And that another user can, you know, maybe only have viewing capability of that, but can, so uh, let's say in one domain you can create systems, on the other you can only view or whatever. So something that fits potentially to a large uh, organization where different people uh, don't necessarily have permissions to everything. Or it could be also for different tenancy. Um, we have, um, it's in another slide, but we have also support for multi-tenancy, multi-location organizations or sub-organizations and so on. Um, so basically, just about that, you could also restrict that the user only sees his own systems. So it's kind of a self-service portal where he can actually only create, maybe only create systems in a lab or only create systems on his own um, machine. I know, for example, a company uh, that they have their developers actually, developer workstations are actually connected to Foreman and they go to Foreman and create VMs on their own instance so they can get the same setup. So there's tons of different use cases for this kind of stuff. Um, it's pretty easy to install Foreman. That means um, we have an installer. It's Puppet-based, so you can you know, hack around and easily understand what's going on. Um, it actually, we try to handle the, all, all of the, um, what you know, normally would, would be required. So obviously Foreman itself, but we also can set up uh, Puppet for you. We can, you know, Puppet Master, if you don't know, if you're just starting with Puppet Master, and we'll set it up with Passenger and all of the details, you know, all of the, comp maybe someone, some of you actually deployed Puppet, felt the pain. Um, we also try to do the complicated stuff, like support Git branching or uh, dynamic environments. Or, so it's all options. You get a, basically, you get a menu where you can say, I want Puppet Master, and in Puppet Master, I want dynamic environments. Um, so you can mix and match easily. Um, so this is a list of plugins that people from the community created. So Foreman is fully extendable. That means everyone can create his own plugin, add another tab in the UI, or had a, add something that happens um, um, wherever in, within the application. Uh, a few examples, like the you, who bought notify, that means you get an RC notification when something happens on Foreman, maybe when an audit uh, entry is created or something. Uh, someone else created a discovery uh, plugin, which means uh, unknown systems can automatically boot into discovery where they report the inventory to Foreman, and then Foreman can consume them. So there's no manual process. You don't have to type in specifically for just for bare metal, but you don't have to type in MAC addresses. And down the road, we plan to do RAID configuration and f firmware upgrades, whatever. All of that kind of stuff could be also done. So the, what I wanted to show is that this, the plugins infrastructure can really be for really minor changes, but at the end they could also be huge features. And um, you know, there's PuppetDB plugin that the guys from CERN wrote, or uh, someone else that you know. Every, there's pretty much a lot of plugins. Um, you know, someone adds another column in the list of systems and so on. Uh, so really extensible. Uh, Foreman has a complete uh, REST API. Um, 
meaning that you can actually do everything you can do in the UI, you can do for the API. Um, pretty pretty uh, straightforward. We have an automatically generated uh, API documentation, so they're always up to date. We actually support multiple API versions, so we can ensure that if you develop something over the API, we won't break it next version. So we'll have official API versions in their release cycle, um, and this way you, we can know that you know, we're not breaking people's stuff. Uh, something that I'll show, um, hopefully I think, well, I pro probably will have enough time in the demo is, is the search um, functionality where Foreman is really search driven. That means um, you can really search for every object and everything in the system pretty fast. And you can consume that. Um, I'll, I'll show example. But you can really consume that. And that's something that a lot of people are doing as an alternative to store configs or PuppetDB, where um, within the API, within your Puppet manifest, you can just say, give me all of the systems that um, belong to this group and reported successfully in the last hour. and." Uh, I don't know, whatever conditions that you might have, uh, and then you can use them in your Puppet code, maybe for cross-systems uh, relationships or, or things like that. Uh, there is also a CLI that uses the API, and there is a mobile app called Remote Admin done by someone from the community that runs on iPhones, iPads, and Android devices. Uh, right, besides that, we have organizations and location support. That's a pretty useful feature for when you have uh, large, you know, multiple data centers or maybe uh, multiple organizations within your organization, like uh, sales, uh, development, engineering, whatever. Uh, or maybe you have a, a mix of them both, let's say engineering and in five different sites, and you want to restrict resources based on that. So, um, for example, I want to allow my uh, engineering to create systems in data center A, data center B, data center C, and only that. And I want to show them only the relevant options, uh, and the rest is restricted, or they don't see systems, or, or things like that. Uh, we also collect trending over time. That means uh, if you want to know, for example, if you're maybe migrating from one operating system to another, and you want to see the progress of the change of operating system here, for those of you using their eyes. Uh, so if you want to track, for example, over time, uh, a change in something, maybe you're upgrading from one Puppet version to another, or maybe you're changing from one OS to another, or whatever it is, you can see over time what the trend looks like. How many machines you have on VMware, how many machines you have on that. Basically, you can either do, you can either do it based on facts, or you can do it on based on stuff the former knows about um, very easily. Uh, a few of Foreman users. So we have uh, CERN, SpaceX, BBC, and so on. I'm, I'm, you know, the challenge of open source is really you don't know who is using it unless there is a complaint. Um, so every week I kind of hear, and I think also happened in this conference, um, it happened that um, I learned about 10 different users that I had no idea about. Uh, so it's kind of awesome that, you know, People are using it, happy with it. Um, there's large organizations, small organizations. Uh, kind of, it, apparently, it fits them all. So I'm very really pleased about that. Um, so if you know and you want to add yourself to the list, there is in the wiki, Foreman has uh, who uses Foreman page entry. Uh, in terms of community, so first of all, the main entry point is the Foreman.org. Uh, you can get all of the information there. Uh, we have. We just crossed 100 contributors, uh, which is awesome, really. If you, any one of you contributed, really thank you. Um, we hang a lot on IRC, so you could find us uh, on Deformin or Deformin Dev channels. Uh, we have a Google Plus um, uh, community page and also our mailing list, uh, dev and users uh, mailing list on Google Groups, and there's a GitHub uh, organization. Uh, now, I think I'll do a demo, but before I start doing a demo, any questions? All right, demo it is. Okay. So, somehow it didn't survive the screen resize. Okay. So, in here, you know what, let's do a real demo. I hope VPN will not uh, fail me. Uh, I'll try to provision a system just that you guys. Uh, uh, well, VPN failed me. 
Hold on, let me try to reconnect to the VPN. Sorry, demos are always bound to, to failures on, on real systems. Okay, before we go to the demo, I'll just browse a bit. Uh, I have a snapshot of the data from a few hours ago from my system. So um, just go over a little bit over the tabs. Uh, in here, this is the dashboard page where you can see what's going on. Obviously, most of the systems I have are out of sync because I uh, synced it a couple of hours ago, so they all seem like they're not responding. Uh, but it gives you a very quick look and understanding of um, what's your state of your know, infrastructure. Did Puppet run? Did it change anything? Was anything uh, broken um, or everything's okay? It really gives you a very quick overview instead of parsing logs or uh, things like that. Um, then you can always also search, like you also only want to care about the production environment maybe. Uh, all the rest you're not that interested in. So you could just you know, basically filter it down. Pretty much looks the same in, in this graph, but you can easily uh, search and create bookmarks here, like what, apparently I had a production bookmark already, uh, like predefined searches that you can, you know, if you care about certain views, um, you can either use that um, in the API or here to get that information. Uh, the other tab here is, would be the host tab. This is where we actually see the systems. Um, Maybe, and again, uh, search is probably the best thing if you're, you're looking interested in some things and there's an autocompleter which uh, tries to help you um, to realize what you can search. Maybe I want to search based on domain or uh, whatever it is, um, groups of systems and so on, like all of my puppet masters have none, but uh, whatever it is, so all of my uh, web servers. Got one, okay. Um, and you could uh, see information, probably, okay. Since I don't have connectivity to, to my virtualization, I don't know why my phone is kind of dying on me. Uh, I, um, I don't have connectivity here to my uh, virtualization, so it doesn't really know what the power state, so that's why it's kind of a yellowish uh, orange, but we can still see like what puppet, uh, some inventory, some basic inventory about the system, we can see, um, you know, this is like a graph of what Puppet did, how much time, um, and so on. Um, we, you know, could see the reports. This is a new system, so it doesn't have so many. Uh, but here's a report for what Puppet did. Um, this is a long list, but there was one error here you could see. Um, and we can probably just get that error. Um, all the same goes for, um, we can see the inventory of, of this system. Let's say um, processor count, I don't know. And then we could see some graphs of other facts, um, how many processors I have, I don't know. And you can, be, you can use your own customized facts um, to, to generate whatever makes sense, like what is the Puppet client version or your application, you know, probably if you know, if you know Puppet, you, you know how that you can easily extend it and put your own uh, uh, code there, especially when the 1.7 release, that it makes it even easier to add your own custom facts. Um, we also have auditing, so we can see here what, what happens. Let's say I take the system, I could see that the system was installed, I could see the history where I created it about three hours ago, and it was successfully created. Um, that means, and we could track here uh, objects uh, really uh, all the way to the, when the, when Foreman was installed. So there's probably, you know, history here and you can search through that history. Um, usually unless you, unless you delete it, it doesn't, you know, um, it stays forever. Um, there's also some sugar synthetic nice graphs like showing you the various always distribution and some graphs that we thought are interesting. Um, like you could click on it and see and you want to see the actual system. So it, you can see that it actually redirects to the search, pre-create the search for you and basically shows you uh, the system. This is, and the same goes for trends where you could just uh, 
look over time what are the trends for a given. In here, you can see that my virtualization is mostly on libvirt, but I have OpenStack and some other uh, systems as well. Uh, we have plenty of screens actually for various things like configuring your Puppet uh, classes, your environments, your proxies, and the same thing goes for um, the provisioning part, um, where we provision, for example, whether it's uh, EC2, libvirt, OpenStack, all of that. This is the interface to w when you create um, a new provider, let's say um, I could choose which kind of interface I want to use. And if, let's say I chose VMware, and I put in the vCenter um, and data center information. If it's, uh, I don't know, rec space, it's something different, and so on. So it's really customized for each and every uh, provider. But from the look and feel, it's um, afterwards, after you configure that, uh, it's pretty much um, the same, like a system on you can see the system that's running on Amazon and the systems running on your data center. More or less the same tool. You see their status, more or less the same thing. You can create them, destroy them, pretty much uh, in the same uh, manner. Uh, I can go for, for a long time showing you all the screens, but any, any question or anything, some one of you want to ask something between, until I get my VPN running again? No? OK. so. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um. Hello? OK. Uh, you talked about all the features and the extensibility that Foreman has. Um, what does a minimal system of Foreman look like uh, just for provisioning uh, DNS, DHCP, and uh, perhaps some um, puppet integration? Uh, what, what do you mean by what does it? You mean hardware or what requirements or what is what what? And what would you? No, mean? how complicated this is to uh, get a minimal form and okay. Uh, um, environment. Um, so I'll, I'll now that I have network. This is form and website. Um, there are a couple of screenshots, a screencast here. Um, quick start installation to get Puppet, basically, and, uh, which is less than 10 minutes, and uh, talk and another uh, demo, another ten, more or less 10 minutes just for the provisioning part. Um, so if you use our installer, um, I'm guessing that within less than an hour, you can get it to work. Um, you know, the, the, the whole thing in the year takes 10 minutes to explain and to do. So um, the installer, you know, assuming you've inst you have an operating system of like a CentOS or whatever running or Debian, um, you run the installer, it takes a minute or two to install all of the packages. Uh, and then it takes, you know, within this video, it takes 10 minutes to go over, explain everything, and also uh, to, you know, configure. So technically, let's say if you don't know anything about it, maybe an hour, um, hopefully. Um, so roughly, uh, you know, the setup of Foreman is probably the more difficult than using Foreman, but um, we try all the time to improve, so I, I can't give you an exact number. Like, it's not a week, right? It's an hour or two. Is that answering your question or? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. So, okay, so I got network again, so I'll try uh, doing a demo now of provisioning a system. Uh, right. So this is my uh, productive Foreman server running back home in Israel. In Israel, um, this is the new host form. I'll just uh, puppet camp D. Uh, I can cho choose like the organization or location because I'm a, I'm an admin user here. So it's like root. I have access to everything, so I could choose where I'm deploying, and then based on that, it, it can tell me what can I where I can deploy. In this case, I have only libvirt over it in EC2 configured. I'll just choose libvirt uh, just for fun. And let's say I want to deploy a web server. A uh, web server, by definition, implies a lot of things that I've already pre-selected. Uh, for example, the uh, Puppet classes, Apache, and Ganglia for monitoring, whatever. Whatever you choose or make. I could um, you know, add stuff like I want to add SSL, maybe. Um, 
And you could see already that um, it automatically uh, assigned IP address for me. Um, based on the um, selection of location and a group, it knew how to find the default domain that I want to deploy in and the default network that I want to deploy in. Uh, in this case, this domain doesn't have um, more than uh, one uh, network, but we definitely support multiple networks, multiple VLANs, all of that uh, stuff, and we also suggest IP address um, automatically by reading your DCP configuration and DNS and, and, and checking whether systems are actually alive and using those IP addresses. So we actually give you an IP address which is not used um, uh, automatically. So it just happens while I was moving between these forms, it went in the background and figured it out. Um, now here we can choose you know, various uh, operating system we want to run on. We can choose the op uh, architecture operating system. Uh, I don't know if you have a preference, I'll just take the latest Fedora 18, for example. Um, I can choose where I'm installing from, what is the disk layout. Um, you know, it's up to you to define all that content. There is a default set of content, but you can override it. You know, maybe you have a speci specific hardware, you want to have a special RAID for hardware, a different hardware, you want something else, and so on. Um, you can even put for a specific server, a specific disk layout. You know, this specific hardware has a special setup. Uh, you can put in here some ERB template that eventually gets triggered into uh, disk layout. Because I've chosen a VM, I can simply choose here, you know, basic storage and network preferences. And also, I'll leave it to the end, but there's all, the whole parameterize classes uh, stuff happening here. Um, anyway, um, I clicked on submit and we could see here there's a progress bar probably. I don't know if you could, you could have followed that went pretty quickly. Uh, it created all of the DNS entries and, and all of those, th that kind of stuff. Um, and we have an integration. In this case, uh, I think this is VNC. Uh, so you can actually see the console within the browser without installing anything. Uh, so this is a JavaScript-based VNC. There is the same thing if we're using um, uh, Spice. I don't know if you know Spice as an alternative to VNC, so we also support in the same uh, fashion um, uh, Spice as well. And basically, in here, okay, it's a bit bigger than my uh, resolution, but um, you know, system is now being created. And there is a handoff where to Puppet, where Puppet um, will start running, and uh, Foreman will handle all of the certificates and all of that stuff that Puppet normally you need to do manually. Um, and afterwards, the system is ready. So it runs Puppet, assuming your manifest does what it's supposed to be doing. You don't need to do anything else. Um, system is running. Um, so, yeah. We can install in exactly the same way. Uh, let's try, oops. Let's try to do uh, another demo. Maybe um, this time on, uh, sorry. I have some, oh, apparently I have some garbage in my database. Great. So that's the problem when you have uh, multiple people playing with your database, uh, my development database. Okay, um, anyway, I'll create another system, demo two, this time um, I'll do it on OpenStack. I guess, how many of you guys ever use OpenStack? Great. So no one here knows how to use OpenStack, which is a great example for how you can deploy something you don't know anything about. Uh, so again, I'll choose my web server. Um, and unless someone really broke my system. Oh, no. OK. So more or less the same thing. In here, you can see that because it's a cloud, there's no IP addresses, right? The network tab really there's no subnet selection or anything like that. Um, and the virtual machine here tab has a different content. Like uh, I, can, I need to select maybe an image because it only works on image and I need to assign floating IPs. You need to know a little bit about the architecture, uh, just a bit, but um, I think more or less this is pretty straightforward. Um, I click on submit and um, Pretty much the same progress bar, just different actions. Now it's going to take a little bit more because more time because um, the VM actually is 
uh, getting created. Um, and um, we wait for the VM to actually to respond, because if it's a cloud instance, we actually SSH into the system afterwards. So there is a whole key SSH key stuff that happens. Uh, multiple cloud providers like EC2 and, and OpenStack has a way to inject an SSH public key into the running instance. Uh, and that happens just for, so you could provision it. So we have different ways of how to inject data into the instance. Um, and in this case, um, yeah, it probably takes a, a minute for the operating system actually to respond to IP and SSH, uh, where SSH can be, uh, yeah, here it is. Um, so created a certificate, now actually running the SSH script that installs Puppet, and basically that's it. Um, how does the content basically get pull, pushed in is where we have uh, provisioning templates. Um, the templates are, um, again, ERB-based, so very similar to the standard Puppet templates. And maybe, I, I guess, uh, let's take a precede, for example. Um, this is, uh, probably should use my local version instead of VPN. Uh, it's not too slow. Yeah, I'll, sw I'll switch to my, let me switch back to my local system so it's a bit faster. Um, so take the precede template, for example, and here we can see we got an editor. Um, this is, I, I, I guess, I hope you can see this size. Is this readable? I guess so. Uh, so for example, uh, you, could, you have this brackets uh, where you could replace variables and that will generate your actual kickstart or precede or whatever text that you want to generate. Uh, could be a SSH script that does something um, and so on. And um, provisioning um, uh, templates have an history. So maybe not this one. Um, let me choose one with some history. I, never, I guess we never changed that default one. But <laughs> Here you could see that someone changed something and you can track the change over time. Uh, here's a diff for someone change, added, my, uh, commented out the no base from the package section. I don't know. But basically we keep track of whatever happens to the templates. Obviously there are full permissions. Who is allowed to edit those templates and you know, all of that stuff. Um, we could also associate templates with um, the operating system. Uh, obviously, so you have to say, okay, this template actually work on these operating system. Obviously, a kickstart doesn't work on Ubuntu, right? Or maybe it does, but not that well. Uh, but anyway, um, you can assign it, and then you can even restrict it further, saying, okay, this template actually is good for only my web servers, uh, or whatever, my web servers in production. So you can kind of restrict down the the possible combinations, who gets the templates, in which scenario, uh, and so on. And we have all kinds of templates, so it's not just a um, uh, kickstart. You can really do, um, for example, uh, the post section. Um, this is the script which is get, gets run on the, for example, the OpenStack instance, or, um, or we have the actual, for those of you who do use PXC, um, let's search uh, PXC Linux, for example. Um, this is actually generating um, the default um, PXC content, like menus, and you can do whatever you want here, uh, like the whatever the, your TFTP server is actually serving. So you can create custom menus, you can update all of your PXCs, um, I don't know, whatever. Um, you could use GPXC or IPXC. I don't know if anyone here knows that technology, um, but it's pretty awesome to be able to consume um, over HTTP, for example, instead of TFTP, which is really slow. And you can do a lot of uh, dynamic uh, stuff with that. Um, again, depends on your use case. Um, so everything that Foreman basically um, deliver in terms of content, it's very easy to consume and edit here, create your own change and so on, really. So um, just today someone mentioned that he uh, imported his old cobbler snippets very easily to this kind of uh, equivalent setup. Uh, when we talk about um, Puppet classes, how many of you guys know what uh, um, parameterized classes in Puppet? Okay, a few of you. So um, 
So when we import classes from Puppet, we actually know how to import all of the parameters. Um, let's say, for example, the, oops, the, the Foreman class actually has quite a few parameters. Um, here you can see the, the Puppet class, and we can um, define the, the, we can see here all of the classes, oh, sorry, all of the parameters, and we could even configure each and every parameter to, um, let's say, whether we allow the user who actually deploy a system to consume that or to override that. So let's say you have a Puppet class that you got from, Pup from Puppet's Forge, and it has 10 different parameters because they try to make it generic, but you only care about one. So you can say, I, I only care about this one, all the rest leave the default. Just for this one, let's say, uh, just for the Foreman URL I actually care, I want to override it. And later on when you go and create a new host, only then you would see that parameter, all the rest will be hidden from you. So kind of simplify from, a, so there's always the assumption that there's someone who knows Puppet, knows the Puppet manifest, understand what's going on, and there's someone who doesn't know anything, he just wants to get a system. And, and really to make their life easier, the ones who are actually consuming those services. And you know, you could really do this um, higher alternative. I don't know if I want to go into this details here, but um, for those of you who use Hyra, uh, there is a whole alternative for that, to figuring out what is the value for a given uh, system. So let's say my NTP server, if I'm in this domain, I want to get this value. If I'm using this cloud provider, I want to get that value. You know, kind of a way to realize what is the right value based on the system that I'm interested in. So that's what I mean by hierarchical. Uh, yep. So, so. Hello. Um, so, Foreman creates the Hira backend? No, it's, or a, is it's actually an alternative. It's an alternative, yes. okay. Because there is some more additional metadata that you can use. So Hyra only knows about facts and Puppet internal, uh, but Foreman also knows, for example, uh, the owner of the system. So if I'm the owner, I want my, my SSH key to get deployed, for example. So this is an additional information that Foreman knows about and can inject the data um, where it doesn't always necessarily the Puppet is aware. Um, so basically, this is a complete alternative. And how is that connected? Uh, there's a couple of ways to, first for the ENC interface, you can get all of the values up front, unlike Hira or the data binding in Puppet 3, where it asks on the fly, every time it reads the manifest, it calls up Hira, Hira goes and parse, and uh, Foreman um, basically creates a, a YAML file. Maybe I can show that. Um, let's say this system. This is the ENC interface, basically this thing here is what Puppet gets from Foreman and then, then Puppet knows what to do. So for example, I have a Ganglia client and it has a parameter called cluster and inside there is uh, a value which was decided by Foreman based on the hierarchy that you've selected. Um, so actually Puppet gets this information up front uh, and, and doesn't need to go call out to Hyra or anything else. And you could cache this. This is actually cached by default on the Puppet Master. So if Foreman is not available or something like that, that data is available as a kind of a compiled version. You can easily put it in version control or you know, just for archiving um, this, this content, which basically what Foreman is generating. Um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Um, so there's plenty of things. Maybe I can uh, briefly talk about locations on organization. So you could configure um, for every location, um, for example, the users that you care about in this organization, the proxies that you care about in the organiza organization, maybe in the networks, uh, and, and so on. Like really, you, you can go up to every resource that Foreman knows about and say, OK, oh, this mirror exists here, so you can use it. but the, the, mirror, the other mirrors are located maybe in different countries. It doesn't make any sense to use them, uh, and so on. Or, or maybe you could say, oh, I don't care about subnets. 
make all subnets available, so they'll always be available on this location. Also the ones that I'll create in the future. So I don't want to handle subnets, I don't care. Um, so really it's, it's, it gives you a way that when you go back to this uh, form here, when you create something, you only get the relevant um, drop-downs. So when I'm in Tel Aviv, I want to see only this, this list of domains. Maybe when I'm in, uh, in uh, I don't know if I have, Okay, I don't have a good example, but when I'm somewhere else, I want to see a different list, right? So only make sure that for the operator that actually end up using it, I am a customer and I'm, I'm getting access to form and I'm only seeing my environment. I only want, I only want to deploy in my environment. I, I don't, you know. And then obviously when I change the context, uh, let me change the context of the user, uh, everything in the application gets coped. So here, I chose the cloud. I don't have any hosts here like the location cloud, I cho will choose the uh, Tel Aviv location and let's say the form an organization, I only, I'll only see uh, the relevant stuff to me um, and everywhere, host list, whatever it is, subnets and so on. Yep. Yeah, you, you could, um, when you edit a user, for example, uh, let's take Dominic, for example, uh, you could say that he has access only, okay, I'm already scoped to a location, so I'm only seeing these compute resources, but I can say he, only, he can only deploy on this compute resource, nothing else, and that's only, the only, you, you can't, like uh, create instances on EC2 or stuff like that. Another user maybe could, but he can't. Is that what you mean, or? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, the, the, so if you care about, let's say, quotas or other features that ha the, let's say, vSphere has, then I, I would suggest that you create a customized account with permissions that has permissions, uh, and then, uh, let's say, quota is something that you know Foreman can't know about. But if the user will say uh, give you an error by saying you're overcommitted your quota, then when a user that tries to use that compute resource, you it will obviously fail. So that's probably the better way to, to approach that. Hopefully I answered the question. Okay. Um, so in terms of users, we just mentioned it. So you, there's, you, know, you could assign users to uh, only, let's say, given domains or only based on um, role. You can access only his web servers or things like that. Or you can even do things like based on uh, facts. Like, I don't know, only the fact, the operating system fact that we, I don't know, Solaris, someone who can only see his Solaris system, if there's still such a beast, um, or whatever. You can, so you can really restrict uh, permissions really in a dynamic uh, fashion, um, allowing people to um, only see what they're supposed to be seeing. Uh, in terms of permissions, um, just, oops, just to show you, um, high level, you can create report roles and so on, and you can see here, this is here the list of different roles that I have in my system, like a manager, viewer, default user, and so on. And then you, you really have, for every action in the UI, like view environments, create environments, edit environments, and so on. And kind of everything here you could um, really restrict down, all the way down to whatever the user needs to be doing. Uh, and that's it. Like otherwise, you won't you won't have access to to, the, to it. And that also works for API. So the same permission works also for the API. So you can have a really customized a API user that can fetch monitoring data or you know status or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, so really kind of useful. Um, we have also, as I mentioned, LDAP. Pretty easy. Uh, both Active Directory and um, um, 
normal LDAP. There is also integration, not here, but integration with, um, uh, I forgot the identity management. Uh, uh, yeah, forgot the name. The one that Red Hat is doing. Um, um, Sorry, IPA, yeah, thank you. Uh, so there's also integration with IPA, and IPA actually has an uh, interface to DCP and DNS by itself, and one-time passwords and all of that stuff. So that's gonna happen as well pretty soon. Um, so really there's integration with OpenStack, uh, uh, in, uh, the identities, uh, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, questions, guys? You're quiet. Nothing? Yeah, go ahead. I can repeat the question. How is provisioning working uh, on bare metal machines? Do I have to um, give the IP address and use of an IPMI interface and Foreman is starting the machine from the IPMI interface or how is this exactly working? Yeah, I didn't show that. So I, when I deploy on bare metal, uh, I could add uh, an interface, network interface, which is the uh, BFC interface. And I would need to put in the MAC address of the BMC um, and the username and password. And Foreman will automatically uh, give it an IP address if it doesn't have one, like what I'm just doing now. You can see, just so I just allocated here an IP address for it. Um, so even if it's not configured, uh, it will be able to configure it, uh, create a DNS for it. So, you, you know, it could be on a completely different network from your uh, server. Um, and um, basically, um, the way it works is that the systems are defaulting to, net, to boot from network. So there's a one-time effort you have to configure your bare metal to, in the boot order to boot from network. And then uh, every time the system boots, it boots into Foreman. Foreman decides whether it needs to boot from local disk or from network. So if you want to reprovision, you don't need to physically go into the server, you know, um, do something. You, you actually, just from this UI, you can reboot it and uh, it reinstalls itself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you should sit closer. So. Um. Foreman is also part of the uh, bigger ecosystem of uh, the new Red Hat um, management system of Catello. Can you quickly talk about yeah. how it relates uh, to Catello and Pulp? Yeah. Um, so uh, some of you might know Red Hat is working on the next generation of satellite, uh, Satellite 6 or whatever it will end up be call being called. Um, where it has uh, two components. One component is handling content, like YAM repositories, handling uh, Puppet modules repositories, handles um, um, subscriptions for Red Hat uh, systems. And that's basically Catello. Uh, the other part, which is provisioning and config management, is Foreman. And Satellite will basically consist of these two products together. So they'll sit side by side and uh, with you know, a lot of integrations between them um, um, behind the scene. And um, yeah, you could provision systems and assign subscriptions and content and so on, like uh, YAM repos and things like that. Yeah. Good. Such a question. What will happen to Cobbler? Cobbler is an excellent open source uh, project. As far as I know, Red Hat is one of the major developers. Uh, it used to be. Um, Mike Dehan, the guy who's now into, um, um, yeah, yeah, Ansible, I have some memory problem today. Uh, Ansible um, project um, is, is no longer at Red Hat for, I guess, a few years, four years or so. And um, Red Hat supports Cobbler internally in Satellite. So sa the old version of Satellite uh, is using Cobbler, but as an internal component, like an engine. Not, it's not exposed to the user uh, necessarily. Um, and they'll support it as long as Satellite is there. But uh, I don't know of any active development in Cobbler. It has a, obviously an open, uh, you know, a community, but not from Reddit's uh, um, point of view. 
May I ask you another one question, the technical one? When you uh, when you showed the dashboard, when you're monitoring the situation status of the network of computers, can you easily add some editable fields? Like, for instance, you you can search based on the information which you pick up from the factors, mm -hmm. as far as I understood. And then, uh, for instance, if I want to add the some comments. Uh, Per, on the per host base, mm -hmm. like uh, room number or building, can I do it easily? Yes, uh, we already have this um, comment field. I don't know, if maybe I went very quickly um, here. That it's like a free text, and you could, I think, you could easily search for it. If not, it's trivial to fix it. That you could search for based on comments, like uh, you could in the search uh, you have. Um, Let's say, I've, I actually, yeah, you're, you're right, comment is not exposed for searching, but we can trivially expose it. But we have an operator, you know, like equal, we have, there's like, and I could say all systems that have, um, I don't know, okay, autocompletes, but you can see there are two results, and I did like DCP. So you could equivalently search for, I don't know, lab two, or whatever your text that you put in the comment. So definitely. Um, and I'll tell you more than that. If there is an automatic way to figure out, for example, uh, sometimes you can fetch information like to which switch you're connected to. Um, and then there is a way that we could maybe automatically understand where you're connected to. Um, or obviously things like the IP address and subnet is very trivial. If you know the subnet is located in a certain place, you want to carry a you know, certain rack or you know, all of that stuff, can, you could also you know, search even without, and all of that data is automatically uh, uploaded to Foreman. So you don't necessarily even need to put the comment in the first place. But I'll, I'll make sure that the next release will search on comment as well, that's trivial. I have another question. Yeah. Um, Puppet is developed uh, by Puppet Labs. Mm -hmm. um, is there any involvement of Puppet Labs in Foreman, or is this just uh, does it just use the open source uh, um, version and with no involvement of Puppet Labs? So the short answer is no. There's no involvement. Um, the long answer is that there's some history. Um, in a couple of sentences, uh, when I started developing Foreman three years ago, three and a half years ago, one of the first things, I, and I always knew it's going to be open source, so one of the first things, uh, I offered it to Luke, um, you know, here's a web interface, why don't we work together? And w Luke's valid concern was that, um, Luke's CEO of Puppet Labs, uh, valid concern was that he thought that Enterprise consoles, you know, management, web UIs, and so on, is something that he wants to make profit out. That's their business, you know, uh, valid business. And as such, he wanted to own the intellectual property. Um, and at that point in time, I kind of felt I need a lawyer. You know, I didn't know what's, what does it mean. You know, he wanted the copyright and so on. I didn't really understand back then anything about licenses. And um, it kind of be, you know, his valid argument is that he wants to own the copyright. You know, if he's going to build a business on top of something, he needs to have, um, you know, good foundations. Uh, and then such, uh, they started uh, Puppet Dashboard um, and uh, later on the Enterprise Console. So sadly, there's no real invol involvement. Okay, any other questions? No. Then, thank you. Thank you. It was a nice presentation. <laughs>